We must uh, move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. The Minister gave notice to the Business Committee last week that it might not be possible for her to return from official business outside Belfast in time for questions. And of course, the very good news in, in terms of the Open uh, would uh, allow members to understand why that situation has arisen. The Minister of Finance and Personnel will therefore respond to questions on her behalf today. And thank you very much, Minister. And I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, the Department's Trading Standards Service has not received any complaints to date about this issue. However, it is investigating to ensure that Thomas Cook's current advertising and information provided to consumers is not misleading in respect of our passenger duty. The Consumer Council has been in direct contact with Thomas Cook since this matter came to light. The company has confirmed that it has investigated this problem and identified 32 passengers that had been affected. Thomas Cook have now confirmed that all affected passengers have now been refunded. The Council is encouraging passengers who might have been affected and not been refunded to contact the airline itself. If they are not content with a response from the airline, then they should contact the Consumer Council, who can investigate the complaint. Mr. Sheehan, for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, since the abolition of our passenger duty, we have seen no additional destinations. And indeed, we have heard recently of the suspension of the only direct flight from the north uh, to the United States. And I wonder if, uh, if I could ask the Minister if the removal of our passenger duty has not been as successful as was at first anticipated. Well, I, mean, I, think, I think it was successful um, primarily in, in, in achieving its number one target in terms of devolving uh, long haul air passenger duty powers to this assembly. And so subsequently, obviously, the assembly then reduced uh, air passenger duty for long haul flights down to zero. Uh, and it was successful in its primary purpose, which was to save the new uh, the New York to Belfast route. Now, I, I share uh, the member's disappointment, I share the minister's disappointment that that service is now going to move for, uh, from a 12-month service, a year-round service, to a 10-month service, um, which will affect uh, sort of January to uh, mid-January to mid-March period um, of next year. I think that is disappointing, um, although I hope that uh, if there is a, a silver lining uh, to the disappointing news, that what I hope that it does is it makes the, uh, the route um, more profitable. Uh, and therefore sustainable. I welcome the fact that United Airlines, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, have confirmed that the route is secure, albeit that it's going to be reduced down to, to 10 months. Uh, I think there, there is a, an interesting point of discussion flowing from this that will feed into the ongoing work that my department and the uh, Minister of uh, Enterprise, Trade and Investments Department is doing in respect of an air connectivity study, which is going to look at, amongst many things around air connectivity, the impact that our passenger duty has on um, attracting routes uh, and keeping routes in place. I think it's interesting to note that um, whilst we have zero, zero pounds in terms of uh, our, our passenger duty for long haul flights like the New York flight, it hasn't been enough to keep it in place for 12 months. And indeed, interestingly, Deputy Speaker, one of the four routes, because it's not just Belfast that was singled out by United, one of the four routes that has been affected is also the Dublin route as well, where they have, uh, also have uh, a zero level of, of our passenger duty or the equivalent. So I don't think it's as, as simple as some members in this House have said that if you eliminate our passenger duty for all flights, then you will see lots more routes opening up uh, in and out of Northern Ireland. Comes to Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers here today. Can the Minister advise what work Deddy has done in trying to encourage direct flights to Turkey as a, an opportunity for tourism? and business opportunities for Northern Ireland? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I know that uh, the Enterprise Minister has been working assiduously at trying to uh, lobby um, a great number of airlines, not just uh, in terms of long-haul routes, including Turkey, which the member has mentioned, but also uh, routes shorter and uh, closer to home as well. Um, because, as I said in the House last week during the, the budget debate on this issue of our passenger duty that Mr. Sheehan raised, um, came up. Um, I think it's important and vital that, as well as looking at long-haul routes, and I, I welcome the fact that the aforementioned Thomas Cook Airlines has also announced in the last week um, direct routes out of Belfast to Orlando and to Las Vegas uh, for the summer. Um, but we also need better connectivity 
through hub airports like Amsterdam, like Frankfurt, uh, like Paris and, and Berlin. Um, uh, Istanbul Airport will be a little bit further away, um, but it is a critically important route as well. It gives us that uh, penetration into, the, uh, into that part of uh, the Middle East and from there beyond that to elsewhere in the Middle East uh, and importantly into emerging markets in the, the Far East as well. Um, and I know that the, the Minister has been um, in working closely with our uh, international airport uh, to try to attract a direct uh, service to Istanbul. Uh, this was an issue that the Minister welcomed the opportunity to discuss with the Turkish Ambassador on his recent visit uh, to Northern Ireland. Uh, however, work that is ongoing on this route is, as you would uh, imagine, Deputy Speaker, um, uh, commercially sensitive and, and, and com of a confidential uh, nature, but should such a service be introduced to Northern Ireland, the uh, Minister's officials in Tourism Ireland would work with key stakeholders to highlight and promote this route in key markets overseas. Mr. Alistair MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And he has mentioned and alluded to uh, shorter haul routes. Could the Minister enlighten us anything in terms of what recent discussions the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment has had with the Treasury or others about reducing the level of air passenger duty on short-haul flights that he has referred to earlier, or indeed connecting flights, short-haul flights to connect to other routes? There have been, I, mean, I, I, I think the member is right to focus on, on Westminster. Um, they, are those, they are responsible for bringing in air passenger duty. If there is a problem with it, and I believe indeed there is a problem in terms of particularly for um, peripheral regions like Northern Ireland, um, then I think the responsibility for solving that problem lies in Westminster as well. And I have spoken in this House before about my concerns and my, my role as Finance Minister about us. Uh, trying to solve the problem, and I'm not entirely sure it would entirely solve the problem, uh, at a cost of between 60 and, and 90 million pounds to, to our budget and to our block grant. I think that's a heavy price for us to be paying to mop up some, somebody else's mess. Um, but discussions are obviously any opportunity that arises to make that point to um, colleagues and ministers in, in Westminster is availed of. Um, I very much welcome to the fact that the Chancellor in his recent budget statement on the, the 19th of March announced the, um, the extending the scope of the Regional Air Connectivity Fund to include start-up aid for new routes from regional airports, which would include Belfast, uh, and will increase the funding to £20 million per annum. I think that's important that the work that our officials in the Department of Enterprise are already doing with their counterparts in the Department of, of Transport across the water uh, are carried forward so that we can see that if there are opportunities to bring in new and additional routes, particularly those short-haul routes that I mentioned before and that the mem member also alluded to, um, can be availed of. Uh, and I think there are other ways, not just our passenger duty, um, that can be other, other measures that can be introduced, not just our passenger duty and lowering that, that could perhaps attract those routes to Northern Ireland. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I also was surprised at the at Thomas Cook situation. But, Minister, you have touched on the matter and, and the wider field, and we all do aspire to having other long haul destinations. But, bearing in mind the experience now of this one, is the Minister satisfied we have sufficient critical mass to actually support further routes? I, I, I think there's no doubt you know, Northern Ireland is a, a small place. We have frequently mentioned that fact in this House. I think the, the increasing amount of inward investment that we're attracting into Northern Ireland helps to make routes like the New York route uh, more sustainable in terms of business traffic that's going back and forward. And I know for, for many of those businesses, is a critically important factor in, in their investment. But the member, you know, the member is, is right. It is, is probably a little more challenging for us in Northern Ireland than, say, for example, our uh, counterparts in, and, uh, in the Irish Republic in, in terms of particularly Dublin Airport uh, attracting routes in because of the, the bigger population, the slightly different economy that they have down there as well. Um, but I think it's, a, it's, it's critically important as well that um, Tourism Ireland have responsibility for marketing Northern Ireland outside of the island of Ireland uh, up their game so that we are attracting in more visitors from beyond, um, beyond Ireland, beyond the British Isles. Uh, and that then in itself justifies not just the, the New York flight, but also some of those other flights into Western Europe and Southern Europe and beyond. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Question two. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the EU emissions trading system is not expected to result in power generation reductions in Northern Ireland. 
the Deputy Minister's officials have been working with the utility regulator and the electrical system operator Sony to ensure there is sufficient generation capacity after 2015 when there are impacts from the EU Industrial Emissions Directive. Sony has recently taken forward a competition for additional generation which is to be available from 2016. The competition resulted in, uh, result is expected in early autumn of 2014, thus allowing sufficient time for the additional capacity to be provided. Mutual Energy is continuing to work towards providing both interim and permanent repairs to restore the Moyle interconnector to full transfer capacity. Mr. Alistair, for supplementary. Yeah. I note that whereas Mr. Gregory Campbell was able to make it back from the welcome announcement up at the Open from Port Rush, that the Deputy Minister, the Minister for Photo Opportunities, was not. Uh, and therefore, can I ask the stand in Minister, has the, um, has the Department really got a grip on how serious this situation could be with Ballylumford B? to be decommissioned, Kuroot to lose 50% of its production, the Moyle interconnector being temperamental at best. Is the department really saying to us with absolute confidence that come the, uh, 2016 we will have sufficient indigenous generation? Or is there not a danger that with the Republic of Ireland companies now, dis now controlling the distribution of electricity in Northern Ireland, that if hard choices have to be made about shedding the load, that Bally Mun's likely to do much better than Bally Money. Um, I'm glad to see that the, the member has met uh, good news in respect of the Open with his traditional grumpiness. Uh, if, uh, if, if Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if, if, uh, if being the Economy Minister requires uh, requires the minister to be photogenic. Well, I'm, I have to say I'm very glad that the, me the member himself is not the minister for the economy. <laughs> uh, he does, though. He does, to be fair. He does raise a, a, a serious issue and, um, in respect of the in, uh, EU Industrial Emissions Directive, which was not the issue that the member raised in his original question. Uh, that will have an impact, and he has mentioned uh, Ballylumford uh, B power station. Um, but I can, I can state categorically that the department, as well as uh, Sony and Airgrid in the South are uh, aware of the issue that the member has raised. Um, they are con there is a, uh, an understanding, as I understand as well myself, that uh, generation surplus in Northern Ireland will drop from 600 to 200 megawatts in 2016. Um, even though it does do that, I understand the adequacy standard will still be met. And that's why, in agreement with the utility regulator, Sony, as I mentioned in my original answer, has, has sought interest from the market for provision of 220 to uh, 300 megawatts of additional generational, uh, generation adequacy. And this would increase our generation margin to around 450 megawatts from 2016. Uh, and with restoration of the more interconnector to full capacity, that would bring the margin to around 650, which would be higher than what it currently is. So, in terms of the, the, the member's sort of doomsday type scenario that he's lining out, it is something that the department is concerned, is, is, uh, is knows about, understands, and is active in terms of working with partners like Sony and our power generators to uh, address as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, Gurma, I got a free old ask you on call yet. I guess Mohihas Lesionaira Kumai. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for at least a good part of his answer anyway. The, um, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask about the photogenic nature of power stations, um, but could I ask the Minister what assessment has been made at the Department of the impact of the EU uh, emissions trading system on the price of electricity for both domestic and business consumers alike? The, as I mentioned to, to the member, uh, or to, in response to Mr. Allister's question in regard to this, the department is, is very aware and is working with uh, Sony and our grid and our uh, partners in um, the Irish Republic uh, to ensure that any uh, reduction in generation adequacy as a result of um, the EU Industrial Emissions Directive is addressed and addressed in advance. And I think that's very important where that's uh, going to have an impact in 2016, that now in 2014 that we're addressing that and we're looking at that. Um, in, in respect of, I'm not aware of whether, what analysis has been done in respect of the directive itself and what that means for electricity prices, although I am 
obviously aware, as, as most members of the House are, that uh, um, about electricity prices and the concerns that many industries in Northern Ireland have uh, about uh, electricity prices. Um, but you know, I think the, the member will be, be well aware in terms of the, the restrictions that there are um, in, in regards to the, the minister and her department and her budget and be able to directly intervene to, to impact on electricity prices. And of course, any intervention, small as it might be, that the minister might be able to make will have an impact on all our customers as well. So there's always a, a fine balance to be struck in, struck in respect of electricity prices and assistance that this department uh, can, can offer. Well, Mr. Paul Free. Thank you very much. And can I just say uh, I welcome very much the, the presence of the Minister in Port Rush and the fact that she is indeed delivering for Northern Ireland, while some can only grump and gripe from the sidelines about it. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, with regards to the generation margin for Northern Ireland 2015, how essential is it that there is full restoration of the Moyle interconnector and that we get, as soon as possible, the proposed North South uh, interconnector? Well, yeah, I think, as I, as I outline in, in response to Mr. Allister, in a, in a situation where the EU directive will reduce our generation adequacy down to, which is still within tolerable levels, but down to about 200 uh, megawatts of, of additional uh, adequacy, it is important that the Moyle interconnector and the repairs that are required uh, to, to that are brought forward as quickly as possible. That gets us back into a much more comfortable position. But the member is also right, Deputy Speaker, to raise the issue of the North South interconnector. Um, uh, Northern Ireland Electricity, I understand, resubmitted its planning application and environmental statement for the Northern Ireland part of the electricity link, link to the Department of the Environment in June of uh, last year. Uh, and the next stage is the resumption of the uh, public inquiry. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that that does move forward. Uh, it's it's a, a key part of our long-term um, security of supply that we have that uh, modern interconnector on the north-south basis in, in place. The Eddie Minister has discussed uh, this issue and particularly the uh, recent disappointing decision by the Irish Planning Board um, uh, that will mean that um, this project will not come under transitional provisions of Article 19 of the EU 10E. Uh, infrastructure regulation. This has been discussed actively by uh, our minister with the air grid chair and also its chief executive, and her officials have met with representatives from the Irish Planning Board. Uh, it's in, it's pr premature, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to conclude uh, that there will be any further delay in the delivery of the project as our grid has undertaken substantial work to support its proposed planning application. And De Deddy will closely monitor further developments in relation to the air grid planning application as part of considerations on how best to deliver long-term security of supply of our electricity. Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, the Minister will be aware, as the, the Minister that sponsors the utility regulator, about their proposal to cancel the, the generating um, agreement units. Can I ask the, the, the Minister, given that both Manufacturing NI and the Consumer Council have said that this will have a, a serious impact on the costs borne by consumers, um, what is the Minister's opinion of this proposal? And does he see it as a, a sweetener to incentivise existing generator companies to upgrade their um, generation equipment in a way that gets them and gets the executive around any state aid implications? Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am not uh, aware of the particular issue that the member raises. And he mentioned that my department, uh, Department of Finance personnel, is a sponsor of uh, the utility regulator. It, isn't. It, is a, it appoints the um, the chairman and the, the board of the uh, utility regulator it doesn't have the same sort of role uh, that the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment has in, in regards to the utility regulator. I'm sure our officials will have heard what the member has asked and will uh, correspond with them accordingly. And I think, as I mentioned, Mr. McGlone, in response to, to, to his question, you know, I think there is a, as, as concern generally about electricity prices in Northern Ireland. I think that's something that would understandably concern us where that may or may not have an impact on. Uh, business investment in Northern Ireland, but I think it's interesting to note that um, there is no evidence being shown, whilst there are uh, the manufacturing uh, sector um, are rightly uh, concerned about the price of electricity in Northern Ireland. Um, there is no evidence, no clear evidence, that it is acting. Electricity prices are acting as a disincentive for or a barrier for investment. In Northern Ireland, the Invest Northern Ireland, when providing evidence to the Enterprise Committee as part of their review of electricity prices, which I understand happened recently, uh, specifically indicated that while alert to electricity prices, they were alert to electricity prices as a potential issue, it has not lost any new projects as a result of energy pricing. 
And that doesn't mean that it isn't something that we're concerned about. It isn't mean, doesn't mean that it's something that we don't take our eye off uh, or that we take our eye off, but it is interesting to note that it is not having a discernible impact on our uh, economic strategy and our inward, particularly our inward investment strategy. And I call Ms May from McLaughlin. Uh, question number three, please. Deputy Speaker, Invest NI is committed to regional development across Northern Ireland, including the Derry City Council and surrounding areas. The Deputy Minister was pleased to announce on the 17th of April of this year Convergence's decision to undertake a £10.1 million investment in Londonderry, promoting 333 jobs, which Invest Northern Ireland has supported with £1.4 million of funding. In December 2013, the Deputy Minister also announced a £8.8 .8 million investment by Fujitsu, which will create 177 new jobs in the area, also supported by, by Invest NI. The most recent figures available from Invest NI 2008 to 2013 show that its assistance of £37 million has contributed to £161 million of investment in Derry City Council area with the potential to create almost 2,000 new jobs. It is interesting to note that over this period, the assistance per head of adult population in the Derry City Council area was £377, compared to a Northern Ireland average of £362 for the same period. Now, SNI is currently working to finalise the 2013 to 14 figures for jobs promoted and created at sub-regional level, including Derry City Council area, and intends to publish this information once the figures have been fully validated. Uh, Invest NI has a regional office in Londonderry, and businesses in the Derry City Council area have the opportunity to access the same levels of financial assistance and advice as other parts of Northern Ireland. However, Invest NI continues to work closely with Derry City Council and other stakeholders to develop a sales proposition to show the strengths and opportunities in the city and surrounding area that will ultimately attract potential inward investors to visit, locate there, and grow. Welcome to supplementary. and I thank. The uh, Minister for a very detailed uh, answer. Uh, can I ask, given the, the very welcome work uh, in, in the region uh, supported by INI to develop that sales proposition and the integrated economic action plan, can I ask, is there any intention as a result of that proposal to actually support or lobby for the North West to become an economic zone, given the regional imbalances? Well, when, when the member um raises the issue of, uh, when she says economic zone, I, I'm interpreting that as an enterprise zone, uh, the, first in the pilot, first pilot in Northern Ireland was recently announced uh, in the Chancellor's uh, budget statement for, uh, for, for the North West, which I think Coleraine is still a part of, Mr, Mr. Campbell to my right is, is uh, nodding vociferously or nodding vigorously that uh, it is still a part of the, the North West. I, I think sometimes whenever, whenever members um, raise the issue of can this area or that area, and, and both myself and the economy minister have been lobbied by quite a few members of this house and, and, and indeed some local councils as well, uh, that particular areas be designated as an enterprise zone. I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding of what the current iteration of uh, enterprise zones looks like. Many of the policy levers that are contained within enterprise zones, which the Treasury are permitting, um, are already within our purview as an assembly, things like uh, rates, which we have a, a pretty attractive regime of, of rates relief, um, access to high-speed broadband, and the ability to um, uh, designate for, for particular planning purposes. They are all within our remit as an assembly, as an executive already. The one thing that is missing from the current proposition for enterprise zones is enhanced capital allowances. And that's why the, the uh, pilot zone was picked for Coleraine, because it was absolutely perfect for it. It was a project designated the Five Nines Data Centre project. Uh, the university site was absolutely ideal. It was already on track. At that time, there was a time limit in respect of getting these projects on the ground and implemented before 2017. That has now been extended, I understand, to 2020. So there are opportunities for potentially other enterprise zones. But enhanced capital allowances are only attractive to businesses who are investing in uh, capital-intensive industries. And some of the, the jobs that I've highlighted that have gone to the North West or to, to the FOIL constituency are not capital-intensive jobs. Now, that doesn't mean that um, there, there may not be opportunities for an enterprise zone in that area, as indeed there may be opportunities elsewhere, but there is more work required to be done in terms of fleshing out exactly where the best place for that is. Thank you. And I call Mr. Paul. Gervin. Sorry, let's, excuse me. Excuse me. I see Pat Ramsey is a constituency representative, and I call him first. <clears throat> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, and I, it is most welcome, the announcement on the efforts by Minister Foster 
for, for the North West. But the Minister should also be mindful that within the North West and Stavan, we still unfortunately have the highest levels of youth unemployment, unemployment and the highest levels of economic inactivity in Northern Ireland. Does the Minister not believe that there should be a more targeted effort, invest, inward investment effort, at those disadvantaged areas where they are hotspots for generations? Look, I think, you know, I think there is hopefully what I have outlined, um, and indeed some of the other things that I know the, the Minister has been involved in, highlights that it isn't a matter of this executive or this minister forgetting about the North West, whether it is an enterprise zone coming to Coleraine and the benefits that that will bring for, for that part of Northern Ireland and indeed for the whole region as well, or whether it is that concentration on getting those high-tech, well-paid jobs and converges or Fujitsu. And I had the privilege of meeting the global president of Fujitsu in London uh, towards the tail end of last year, incredibly complimentary about the standard of the workforce right across Northern Ireland and wanted to bring that additional investment, which he and I spoke about that day, uh, to, to London Derry, uh, complimentary about the workforce that was already there, saw it as a, a great opportunity for his business. And I think people in, in uh, London Derry should um, be, be proud of the fact that companies like Fujitsu, who have billions and billions and billions of pounds in their portfolio, could invest that money anywhere in the world or choosing to invest it in London Derry and to avail of the, the excellent skills that are there and the wonderful infrastructure that is there as well. Um, and you know, I think that there, nobody could, I think, in all honesty, stand up and criticise the, the Minister of Enterprise or her department or Invest Northern Ireland for the efforts that they have put in in the North West, and whether it's the uh, local uh, business startups, of which between 2012 and 13, 165 startups uh, have been approved in the Foyle constituency, the Jobs Fund, which has promoted 567 new jobs in the Foyle constituency between 2011 and 2013, or the Loan Fund. Uh, which has seen nine companies offered support of £2.695 million. There are efforts going on. There, are, there is work uh, happening to attract businesses and to start and to grow existing businesses in the North West. Uh, and in respect of youth unemployment and, and the range of issues that the member talked about, he will, of course, be mindful that there is a responsibility for the Dell Minister in, in regards to all of that. And some of those issues are, I'm sure, are better taken up with him. Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answer so, thus far, but in, in doing that, I appreciate that a lot of the work done by uh, both Invest NI and the Minister would be in relation to uh, encouraging and promoting existing homegrown industry and business, uh, and especially in South Antrim, I know we have had some very good results, but Northern Ireland being a very small area, I appreciate that people do travel from quite a distance to their work. Uh, two hours can, you can be able from one end of the, to the other. I want to know, just in relation to uh, South Antrim, how many jobs have been created in the South Antrim area? It's, it's entirely up to the Minister, but this was a constituency specific question. But if he wishes to answer the question. I'm trying to find the, uh, the information. Um, uh, in, in South Antrim, the, the, the in terms of investment, uh, Vest NI assistance and investment uh, over the last 10 year period in South Antrim, uh, there have been over 2,000 offers, 2,057 offers uh, made. In terms of inward in investment into the South Antrim area, there have been 175, uh, and that has created 692 new jobs and also uh, secured 130. Uh, that accounts for about £18.63 million worth of assistance offered. And South Antrim is an area I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with, Mr. As of course you are your, your, yourself, and it is home to, to many good companies, the likes of Randox and, and others, who are uh, good indigenous Northern Ireland growing companies who are exporting far and wide and, and bringing much pride to the Northern Ireland economy. We're all uh, in awe of your quick footedness, Minister. Could I call Tom Elliott with the same health warning? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And no time's running out, but. Um, the Detty are obviously responsible for tourism, and I'm just wondering how much money has been provided uh, to the, the Derry City or Wall City project uh, in London Derry, uh, and also to the Fermanagh Tourism Project of Destination Fermanagh. <laughs> <coughs> In, 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 incredibly tangential uh, from a uh, question about, about the North West. The, the, the member will be aware, um, obviously his, his heart lies in, in the, the, inside the walls of Derry as uh, asking a, a question like this. Um, the, there has been sizable investment um, 
a lot of it around the uh, UK city of culture, uh, to develop our cultural infrastructure in Londonderry, um, investment in a number of uh, assets, some 1.4 million in the walled city lighting strategy, which is, uh, and also investment, uh, as a member will be aware, in the likes of the Apprentice Boys Memorial Hall, First Derry Presbyterian Church, uh, the Playhouse Theatre, and, and other um, assets in the the Northwest as well. In terms of the, the Fermanagh figures, I don't have those to, to hand. As, uh, is, uh, I, I humbly apologise to the House for. Um, but of course, the, uh, the member will be aware of not just the, the benefit that the hosting, the successful hosting of the G8 Summit a, a year ago, actually this week, um, brought to Fermanagh, but that the uh, building on the the Irish Open success in Port Rush a number of years ago that the, uh, Open ha the Irish Open has been secured. I said the Open has been secured for Fermanagh, that would be news. Uh, the Irish Open has been secured for Fermanagh in, I think, uh, 2017, I think it's been secured for there. So um, building on the success of the G8 and the Irish Open in the, in the North West, uh, Fermanagh is well positioned to um, uh, utilise or to benefit from uh, the growth in our tourism sector. Thank you. And that uh, brings us to the end of the period for oral and creative questions to the Minister. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms Judith Cochrane. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister um, to outline how the Department is exploring the tourism opportunities flowing from the growing uh, creative industry sector, especially um, the exposure through t TV shows such as Game of Thrones? Well, the, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think, I think we, should, we should note and welcome the fact that Northern Ireland is getting an increasing amount of exposure uh, globally um, as a result of um, our burgeoning uh, creative industry sector, particularly film and, and television uh, production. Uh, the member has mentioned uh, Game, Game of Thrones. Um, and we've now uh, completed the filming of uh, four series of uh, Game of Thrones in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and seasons five and six, I think, are, are also secured uh, for, for Northern Ireland. Um, I understand that the, up to season three, that has generated some £80 million pounds for our local economy, but that excludes revenue flowing from uh, tourism spend as a result of it. And there's a lot of work um, going on, concentrating on trying to avail of the, the tourism opportunities that come from having an international series like Game of Thrones filmed here in Northern Ireland. The member house will be aware, I'm sure, of uh, bus tours and walking tours that are being organised, uh, of the interpretive signage that has been put on some of the filming locations, uh, and also the, the recent campaign which is running from April to June uh, by Tourism Ireland to um, advertise, and, and with, the, with the permission of HBO, uh, and, and who are the makers of Game of Thrones, to advertise and showcase some of Northern Ireland's most attractive scenery, which has been the backdrop for many of the scenes in uh, Game of Thrones. And that's been uh, sent around the world, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to attract in those who are, um, not just those who are interested in the series and have seen Northern Ireland in the series and wondered perhaps where that scenery was, but also others as well who are just uh, um, interested in, in, in going to such a, a, a beautiful place. Ms. Cochrane for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. Given now uh, the clear importance of the link between Tourism Ireland and HBO, what is the Minister's view of the um, recent comments by HBO executive Michael Lombardo when he said Belfast is not the most cosmopolitan of cities in which to spend half the year? And if there is truth in that comment, what can be done to change it? Well, I'm, I'm tempted, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, just as given the World Cup is on at the minute and, and there's no football saying in this part of the world that we're not Brazil, we're, we're Northern Ireland. So it, uh, when it comes to uh, filming locations, you know, we're not Hollywood, we're Northern Ireland. Um, and, and I understand the, the, the comments made by Mr Lombardo were, as the member says, about being away for six months. Uh, and I'm sure for, for, for anybody, no matter who they are, being away from their home and their family for, for six months is a, is a difficult thing to do. Um, I have to say, though, that the relationship between HBO and Northern Ireland Screen and the Northern Ireland Executive has been incredibly productive. As I said in my previous answer, seasons five and season six have already been secured for Northern Ireland, so it seems that we're doing something right in respect of, of HBO. I think that everybody in this House and further field would acknowledge that Northern Ireland is a much improved city than it was ten years ago. You know, ten years ago we wouldn't have dreamt of attracting any sort of series from HBO, uh, never mind six seasons of, of their biggest show ever. Um, we are a city that is developing, maturing. It has a, um, some great restaurants and improving nightlife. Um, it has uh, some world-class events uh, that it's hosting. 
uh, and was also developed cultural facilities like the, the Lyric Theatre and the MAC and the Grand Opera House, which are, are all important in attracting in visitors. Uh, and more importantly, I think, uh, um, to sort of combat some of the comments that have been made about Belfast, if you look at other international investors, the likes of Allstate and City, uh, who keep coming back to Northern Ireland and invest time and time again, it's, it's uh, that sort of cultural offering that we have is very, very important to them and more importantly to the staff that they employ. So I think Belfast is doing well. I think Belfast is doing some things right if, if it's if attracting in companies of the likes of Allstate and cities and others that we've heard over the last number of weeks and months uh, and also retaining the HBO for six seasons now of Game of Thrones. Mr. Cahill of Hushin. Given a recent survey which showed that some 14,800 people regularly commute uh, between the two jurisdictions on the islands uh, for work or to study, uh, what efforts are, is the Minister doing to enhance cross-border labour mobility? Well, obviously, in terms of, for, 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 for those 14,800, I'm not sure what the division between those who are travelling for work uh, and those who are travelling for, for study. I suspect. Um, in terms of study, knowing the issues that the Dell Minister has, particularly in the, uh, with the North West Regional College and um, students coming from the Donegal area into the facilities in Londonderry, that the bulk of that student movement, and equally then the problems of uh, students from here having accessing uh, southern universities, particularly at Trinity and others, um, that the bulk of that movement is in a, a northwards direction. Um, obviously, some people will choose to, to do that for, for personal reasons, others will. Um, be forced into it because of courses or because work dictates that they go in that direction. In terms of what the minister and her department are directly doing in respect of this, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, completely versed on, um, but um, I'm sure that um, we can investigate and furnish the member with some details. Call Mr. Hushin for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer there. Uh, given the current challenges of unemployment and emigration, uh, what steps will the Minister uh, take to ensure that both businesses and individuals can benefit both from uh, local and island wide opportunities? Well, obviously, the member will be familiar with the work of Industry in Ireland, which is um, as was uh, studying uh, just over the weekend, has exceeded its targets this year in terms of encouraging companies to innovate and to export uh, across the border. Uh, and as we're trying to grow our economy and, and we're trying to get uh, firms in Northern Ireland to look beyond Northern Ireland for market opportunities, um, the Republic of Ireland market is a, an easier first step for many of them than perhaps even Great Britain or into, the, into uh, continental Europe. Um, so the work of Intertrade Ireland is something I think is important in, in uh, ensuring that that market, which is, has actually been growing over the last couple of years in terms of the size of the market between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, uh, continues to grow. Uh, and as their economy in the south improves, I think it's important that firms in Northern Ireland are availing of those opportunities of a growing economy there, just as they are uh, of a growing economy here at home. And I call Mr George Robinson. Mr Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I'm sure we'd all agree that uh, the main topical question from a sporting and tourist point of view is the announcement today of the Open Golf Tournament coming to Royal Portrush in my East Londonderry constituency. Uh, from Derry's point of view, I'd like to ask um, what role they played in bringing the Open back to Northern Ireland. I thank the, the member for the first question. I'm surprised it got as far as, as question number three before this came up as a, as a topical question. Um, and can I join with uh, the member? Uh, I think probably most of his constituents in, in welcoming the news today that uh, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club has, um, is, asking, is requesting that Royal Port Rush be put back onto the rota for Open Championships. Uh, and we are obviously then looking forward to that being agreed and the Open Championship coming back to Northern Ireland for the first time since uh, I think it was 1952 53. Um, it's been a long time away and it'll be good, good to get it back, building on the success of the, the Irish Open. And the, the member will be very familiar with the work that the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and the Northern Ireland Executive is, is making uh, to secure not just the Open but other events like the recently successful Giro d'Italia. Uh, the Irish Open was an incredibly successful event for the European Tour. It was its first sellout event for, in its history. Um, and I think it's that sort of success and us proving that we can host events of that magnitude that has uh, whet the appetite of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club again, and we are, are, are seeing um, this uh, positive announcement today and, and looking forward to the Open coming back to Northern Ireland before the decade is out. 
Mr. Robinson for a supplementary. <clears throat> Thank the Minister for his answer. And could I ask the Minister what can be done to provide greater hotel accommodation in the North Coast area to cater for more tourists, potential um, more tourists coming to the area because of the Gulf announcement? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member is, is, is right to highlight the um, potential tourism opportunities that flow from the Open Championships and one of the primary reasons why um, Mr. Foster and her team have pursued uh, the Open Championship and worked with Royal Port Rush to uh, get it back on, on the road. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is an estimated combined tourism promotion and economic return from the Open Championships of some £70 million. Pounds, and that sounds like a lot of money for, for one event, but whenever you realise that uh, last year, uh, when the event was held in Muirfield in Scotland, outside Edinburgh, over 4,000 hours of television and radio coverage were broadcast. So there is a huge, um, it's, well, it's one of the world's biggest sporting events, um, attracting crowds from far and wide for the event itself, broadcasting the, the uh, wonderful scenery and the great golf course that there is in, in Royal Portrush to that big an audience is clearly going to reap tourism benefits. And Invest Northern Ireland is, is very much open to considering support for projects to develop accommodation in the North Coast area, particularly projects that will underpin uh, signature projects such as the Causeway Coastal Route, uh, and as well as the Tourism Action Plan uh, up to, to 2020. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland continues to work with existing hotel operators to support business improvements and competitiveness. An example of this is the support provided to assist the £10 million expansion of Galgorm Resort and Spa, which includes an additional 50 rooms. Uh, I think, as the, the, the Irish Open showed us uh, whenever it was here a couple of years ago, that um, even, though, um, even though we perhaps in Northern Ireland consider, as listening to some of the RD questions, that the travel time between here and the North Coast might seem like a lot to us to people coming in from far and wide. It's actually not that far for them to stay in Belfast and to travel up and to enjoy the scenery and to enjoy the Open Championship and to perhaps spend some more time in that area. And I call Ms Maeve McLaughlin. Um, and I suppose given the, the very real uh, challenges to businesses in terms of bureaucracy and increasing levels of bureaucracy, could I ask the Minister maybe to give us an update on the uh, business red tape review that's currently Underway. Thank you. Yeah, well, look, I, I, um, I agree with the, the member's concern that, in terms of, I mean, it's, it's something that I, that I hear regularly about, uh, even in my, in my role, about the concerns that businesses have that government is always getting in their way and government is, is causing them, um, costing them money, particularly in terms of some of the surveys that even officials from my department will send out to them. In terms of the uh, red tape review, I'm trying to find the information here before me because I know I have it somewhere, but I can't lay my hands on it. Um, but I know that the, the minister was very keen to take that review forward, uh, understanding that there was uh, was that concern that there was there. And I think it's important, uh, Deputy Speaker, if there is if there is a concern, and I understand that there is a concern there amongst business that uh, we as an executive look at all of the red tape, uh, for want of a better phrase. And indeed, I think there's a responsibility on business to come forward um, with what it perceives to be concerns about, about red tape. Um, because I sometimes hear, when I travel around the country in my capacity as, my, as finance minister, people saying business get, our government keeps getting in our way, red tape is a problem. Whenever you ask for specific examples, sometimes they're few and far between. So I think there's an onus on businesses and business groups to come forward with um, precise examples as to what red tape means. Um, the advisory panel um, uh, on the review of business red tape is scheduled to meet a group of business representative bodies on the 12th of uh, June, so that was uh, last week, and a seminar workshop for regulators to discuss a number of key issues relating to the review also took place at the start of this month. Uh, these were very constructive events which will feed into further business engagement. Uh, Sir Deputy Speaker, an innovation laboratory is being held in the last week of June to consider independent scrutiny of regulatory impact assessments. And that's an initiative being taken forward uh, by my department, and Deddy has been keen to, to join in with that public sector innovation laboratory. Uh, and there are also two research projects and fees and charges and possible regulatory business hub are both progressing well. I will report by the end of June, early July. And, and I thank the Minister for that and appreciate that he didn't have to access the information. Um, but could I ask maybe, in terms of the way forward, is there any thinking specifically around red tape or, or the challenges growing businesses in, a, in, in border constituencies or on a cross-border basis? Thank you. 
Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't think a distinction is being made in the review between you know, Belfast and uh, the south, north, east, or west of, of Northern Ireland. I think if there is a problem in respect of red tape, it will be uniform right across the, the country. Can I also mention, too, that the, the Dell Minister is taking forward a review of employment law. One of the common concerns that gets raised uh, with me, and I'm sure with my, my colleague, the Economy Minister, is the concern about our, our perceived overburdensome employment laws in Northern Ireland. And I think that if that's something that our businesses are concerned about, and certainly talking to the likes of the CBI and the IOD and others, it's something that they regularly raise. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for all of us to get behind that review that the Minister for Employment and Learning is conducting. And I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. We're almost out of time, Mr. Agnew, so you want to move quickly? Make it quick. Okay. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I will be quick. Um, and I wanted to ask the Eddy Minister what meeting she's had with the Finance Minister, so um, we've got an appropriate standing. Um, could, 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 could I ask Mr. Hamilton, in whatever capacity he wishes to answer, um, what discussions uh, he and Arlene Foster have had around the business tenancies order and the, the, the legislation, the differences in legislation between here and GB that's restricting the growth of free PV schemes? There, there, this is probably more for, for it is for this is for me and you're, you're, well, you'll get me answering it no matter what. But um, it, this is one for me in my DFP capacity. I think I think my understanding is that uh, work has been by the civil law reform department within a uh, division within my department. This is work that they are looking at uh, on business tenancies, along with a range of other uh, land law type issues in, in, in Northern Ireland. And it is something that certainly we are looking. At. It's not in the uh, uh, the short term something that we're going to progress, but I think it's certainly something that's uh, in the medium to, to long term something that the department is looking at. Uh, I'm, I'm happy in, in my capacity as finance minister to write to the member and, and give him a little bit more detail, and perhaps we can correspond about the, about the particular detail and to see whether that's something that could be incorporated in any review of business tenancies. Minister, order time is up.